Welcome to Life Bursts. I'm Sarah. And I'm Matt. Welcome a hand out to a hand up. The journey of a Salvation Army officer next. Yes, welcome to Life Burst with Matt and Sarah. Today we are chatting with Daniel and there is so much more to Daniel than just being a Salvation Army officer and I'm really looking forward to going into that more today. So thanks Daniel for coming in on Life Burst today. No worries, thanks for having me. Let's start at the very beginning. Where did life start out for you, Daniel? Uh, Life started out for me in Rockhampton up in central Queensland. Um, hot, humid area, mm. so um, not much winter, maybe a week if you're lucky. Owned one jumper in my time that I lived up there, so um, it's been a bit of a change moving to a colder climate. But yeah, Rockhampton was home. Um, my family been there as long as I can remember. Um, it's just a, a country town, so um, we classified as the beef capital up there in Rockhampton and um, a lot of cattle, trucks. Um, it's kind of the gateway if you want to head any further north of Queensland, um, you've got to go through Rockhampton, but um, fairly large population, about 100,000 people up there and um, just really enjoyed my time up there, especially with the family. But um, I lived in a what we call a Queenslander house. Um, so, you know, nice airflow, big high um, off the ground. But my grandma and grandfather lived down the street. So on one corner of the street, we lived on the opposite corner and my auntie lived in the middle. Um, so it was a very family friendly mm. environment um, and family affair there, but it was also good because you had places to visit throughout the week and, and everything. So I did enjoy that. Um, having family close by was always helpful and that's been a bit of a change for us mm. since moving to Mount Barker. Um, it's, yeah, family are thousands of kilometres away, so that always adds a difference to dynamics. But um, Rockhampton growing up, um, primary school, I remember bits and pieces with only a small school and um, it's a very sporty place. Everything revolves around sports. Um, so I really remember that involvement in many different sports um, from cricket to tennis. Um, I think we had a little bit of a hand in softball, but that was um, not for long. And then rugby league, or I think you call it down here rugby, even mm-hmm. though there's two different versions of the sport, <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> we won't get into that now. Um so that was, I suppose, first involvements in life really was finding that commitment and where I really sort of sat in those spaces, never saw myself as a big sports person, probably until I really started playing it. Um, my dad is a bus driver, um, so traveling was just his passion. Mm. He loved being in the car or the bus um, and traveling places. Mum. She's had a few different line of work. Um, she started as a nurse that I remember, and it's possible that she had a job before that, but my early memories of mum is a nurse. She then transitioned to being full-time mum. Um, so I had a little brother, and I'll get to that shortly. But um, And then she transitioned into community service work. Um, so she really enjoyed that type of field and, and space. But yeah, so mum and dad... Um, very tight-knit family. We enjoyed doing things together where we could and, and being a part of that. But have an older sister. Um, she's currently in Harvey Bay, um, actually as a minister there. Um, but we didn't really get along all that well as young kids. Um, we tended to kind of keep to ourselves and have our own space there. But um, at the same time, I think family holidays, I do remember a lot of connection with her. Um, and then I have a younger brother who is about nine years younger than me. Right. Hence why mum ended up being full-time mum for a while. Mm. Um, he's six foot five, um, giant in the family. But um, again, probably that separation and that space was in an interesting time in my life. And mm-hmm. I remember using him as a tackle bag for a little bit of period of time <laughs> um, in a polite way as a little kid and, you know, put the pillows down and sort of having that space, trying to find how I engaged with somebody nine years younger mm. than me um, was a difficult space. But, yeah, really, really close now. It's one of those things we're constantly on the phone or messages and communication, just keeping up with each other now. But I would never have thought that 30-odd years ago when we were growing up together. So family time was good. It was really valuable. Birthdays, I remember, very family-orientated, and it was always about being together and 
nothing else mattered on the day. If it was your birthday, everyone's together. If it was Christmas, um, that was about a three-day event. Mm -hmm. um, different family from all around Queensland would sort of come together and mm -hmm. we'd join into that space together. And yeah, so there was always an adventure. Um, I have a little bit of a mischievous side. Um, some okay. people may not believe it, but <laughs> primary school was not my ideal time growing up. Um, I, there was a running joke that grade two, I spent more time in the principal's office uh -huh. than I did in the classroom. Um, don't know why really, but it was just one of those things. I think easily swayed, easily pulled around and just trying to find out probably who I was in that time and space. So that was fun. Mm -hmm. My biggest memory of primary school would have to be my grade six teacher. And, um, I remember she was away for three or four weeks at the start of term and, I was like the worst kid in class. I was misbehaved, didn't do a thing right. And I remember her coming back and I remember it vividly. She sat me down and went, you're better than this. You can do more than this. You know, I want you to turn around and, and find a better path for what you're doing. And that really, I think at the time, rattled me a little bit. And yeah. Probably at the time, I probably laughed it off and walked away. But I, I probably found that that rattled me the most. But probably my biggest memory of primary school to date. After that, I started probably to pursue a little bit more leadership. Um, started on the sporting field. Um, so I wanted to be more of an example. Um, look, I pushed for captaincy on the, the football team. Never ever happened. Um, never understood why, but it kept driving me to want to be and to do better. Um, that led then to applying to be school captain in primary school. Um, I didn't get that. One of my good friends who was my best um, best man at my wedding ended up getting that and I didn't envy him, but I got sports captain. So mm. I was pretty excited by that. And um, I think from there, it kind of just helped to push for who I was and really made me stop and think um, to sort of reassess where I was at and what type of things I was doing. So um, that transition then from primary school to high school, I found that a bit difficult. Um, again, I think, you know, you go from being the eldest in a school and I suppose showing leadership to just filtering in. We went from a primary school of about a hundred kids to a high school of 1200 kids. Mm. Um, so you just get lost in a system. Mm. There's, um, so we were grade eight still at high school. We hadn't transitioned I mean, Queensland at that point in time. Um, you know, turning up and there was 10 cohorts of grade eights with about 20 odd kids in each class. Mm -hmm. And, um, the group of kids I was in, it was a bit of a difficult space. They were, um, I suppose, kids that were still finding their way as well. So there was a few issues, um, a lot of clashes in the classroom, just a lot of personalities that did not get along um, at all. And so, Was it ever physical? You know, you hear about people throwing chairs around and oh, stuff like that. Look, I've got or... a few burn marks on my arm from <laughs> those okay. days where one of the kids would, you know, use the bottom of a... Um, a razor or something like that, and they'd heat it up so much and they hit your arm with it. Oh. We didn't have a lot of probably physical, but it was just probably almost directed to the teachers. It was a real, a more of a discipline, I'd probably call it, um, space where everybody just talked over the top of everyone else and there was just no cohesion at all in the space. So most of grade eight was quite difficult. Um, I'd actually received a sporting bursary going to the school. Um, Mum and dad struggled a little bit financially at that point in time. So just to be able to get that support was really good. Um, but my sister had been, you know, two years in the school. She's two years older than me. She was very academic, like very, she got ducks in primary school and she was always fairly high up in her marks, even in high school. And I, I do remember my first sort of week at school, that comparison of, are you going to be like your sister? Oh yes, we've got Daniel. And um, he's going to be just like his sister. And I'm like, nah, actually, I'm not. You've picked the wrong person if you think that's going to happen. <laughs> um, so I probably rebelled against academics just because of my sister. Um, but at the same time, I could pursue if I wanted to. But yeah, that grade eight threw me around. There was a few instances where, as a class, we probably upset teachers. Um, and it wasn't until the sort of that last term of grade eight that I realized that I'm actually contributing to this. Um, I'm, you know, actually supporting the negativity that was happening in that space. So mm -hmm. yeah, maybe well, that might be a good spot to pause. <laughs> it sounds like there's a bit of a turnaround about to come. Yeah. 
Uh, well, thank you for sharing. Uh, this is Life Bursts. Uh, we are chatting to Daniel, and we'll be back right after this. This is Life Burst with Sarah and Matt. We are chatting to Daniel. Uh, we're up to the end of year eight, where uh, it's been a tumultuous year, mm. and uh, you've been contributing to this, but a light bulb, light bulb moment. Yes, um, I think a light bulb moment, but okay. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, it, it's probably maybe a little bit more than that, but um, I suppose the moment for me coming out of grade eight was early grade nine. Um, I asked this lovely lady to date me. Um, you know, Valentine's Day, that's always romantic to, mm. to ask on those, you know, romantic days. It means you don't have to provide flowers on the day. So that's always a bonus. But um, Don't you give her flowers when you, like, ask her? No, well, it was 8 o'clock at night. Oh, so yeah. it was so too you late. got away with that, didn't exactly. you? Exactly. Yeah. So I waited till 8 o'clock at night, <laughs> rang, and it was on one of those old corded phones. Yeah. A yeah. lot of kids these days don't know how to use, but I remember pacing the, the floor um, quite yeah, regularly within the limits of yeah that's right of the cord, of the cord so, <laughs> and you'd stretch it as far as you could before the static hit but um yeah so started going out with this amazing woman andrea her name and um you know what 14 about the you know, around for that 14 age group and i think that gave me a bit of structure in my life and probably something i hadn't had a lot of at this point in time but sports was still probably at that point in time my Big focus. Um, at how, this point. how did she give you structure? Oh, how did she give me structure? Yeah, how? Um, look, she is a very strong personality, um, saying that nicely. Um, don't want to get in trouble. But, <laughs> yeah, so she, she probably keeps me real. Um, so she okay. will keep me accountable. She will call me out for things or essentially question, you know, why did you do that or why is it that you do that um, in that space? So... Just having that, I think, environment and that feedback really for me um, created a bit more structure in my life. But around the same time, um, a couple of other big things were happening. So at this stage, I was quite heavily involved in BMX racing. So not all the stunts and the tricks, but um, the actual on, a, I suppose, like a motocross um, stadium type feel. There was jumps and bumps and everything there. And I'd been probably doing it for about four or five years. And um, Easter time, we were heading up to Darwin for a national event, my first time that I'd committed to do a national event. And um, so headed up there. And I think for, again, for me, that responsibility that BMX is a single sport and I'd played a lot of team sports. And so the accountability really came to me solely. And if I perform well, it was because I put the effort in. Um, if I'd perform poorly, then again, it was my lack of effort. So I pushed myself. I trained morning, afternoons, nights, everywhere I could. I was training um, and went up there for my age group. Um, and I think I came, I think it was sixth actually out of my age group um, in that space, which was more than high than my expectation. Um, I came out of that on a real high, um, feeling really confident. You know, I had a girlfriend now. I'd been to a national event um, and performed really well in that space. But um, June, July that year, my um, uncle was a paramedic and uh, he was on a rescue mission in the helicopter for a family that lived about probably an hour and a half, two hours drive out of Rockhampton. Um, and being that distance, they had to take the helicopter out. Mm -hmm. Well, four o'clock that morning or four, five o'clock that morning, my dad walks into my bedroom and says, there's been an accident. Something's happened. Um, your uncle was involved. And I went, okay, honestly, I rolled over and I went back to sleep. Um, 10 minutes later, he comes and knocks on the door again and goes, all right, we've just had an update. You know, your uncle was in the helicopter. It's crashed. Um, he's passed away. So for me, that was like that. Boom. Mm. Everything's just changed in that moment. Mm. Um, you know, 14 year old, I not idolized, but I really looked up to my uncle. He lived halfway down the street, so I could go and visit him regularly. He was a cricket fanatic. He was, you know, loved his sports and um, very passionate in what he believed in um in that space and so for me it was just almost like a whole reset switch and i kind of went what does my life mean if this 32 year old guy has been in an accident you know lost his life he had a three-year-old son um so you know the whole family just really lost focus mm. in that space but at the same time we refocused and i think that was my switch moment um in my life to go well actually here's a person who's made a difference Mm -hmm. through his field of work, you know, as a father, as an uncle, um, in that dedication. And so I was able to, I think, sort of look to that a little bit. And so that changed my mentality. So I 
strove a little bit more personally to really push and what I'd learned throughout that year you know through Andrew's accountability at the time um, my own perseverance to know actually I can be better than who I am and I know that through my sports but in particular through that tragic event in the family mm -hmm. you know how do I improve who I am and, and become a better person so my last three years of high school I, I believe um, you know was a real turning point um, i adapted who I was, I changed my mentality. So in classrooms, you know, more attentive, asked better questions or phrased questions better and um, came down to a bit of a close call and the captaincy, even in, in grade 12, I'd applied for school captain and um, I got vice captain, but there was, you know, four or five votes between two or three of us in that space. And again, that was that confidence builder. But for me, it was again, that reflection back to my grade six teacher um, that she said, you know, I could have been so much better and I have the attitude or the mentality to be better if only I push myself in that space. So um, that led to high school, uh, sorry, to university. Um, I did 12 months in university. I was looking at sports science. It was a real passion, again, in that sports field and how all the dynamics of a person worked and everything there. And um, I lasted 12 months. I went to my university um, dean at the time and said, is there going to be any practical work in this? And he basically went, no, nah, it's all the theory for three years. I said, well, I'll see you later. Um, Andrea's dad was a refrigeration mechanic, um, a small business, so it was just him um, and sometimes an apprentice. And so I was still dating uh, his daughter, essentially, and I don't think we were engaged at that stage, but... Um, he basically said, oh, I'm needing an apprentice for a few months. Were you you're interested in this work? And I'd never been really a hands-on person. I'd always kind of felt see myself as a sporty, but not sort of that hands-on mechanical side. So I started, did three months, um, I suppose, as a trial basis with him. I really loved the work. It was rewarding, not just for me, but I really felt, because we were working with a lot of other small businesses, mm -hmm. um, you know, you would hear the hearts of people when you went in and, you know, we worked at places like Wendy's, McDonald's, you know, some, yes, there can be larger franchises, but at the same time, we worked in the corner stores like your little IGAs or just that little corner store. Um, and you'd hear of the hardship that they're going through and you'd be like, okay, you know, this job probably could take me two hours, but I'm going to make sure I get it done in an hour so that I'm just helping save a bit of money there. But I think on the other side of that too, is understanding the business side and so I just really found a heart in that space. Um, you know, it wasn't just there was something different every day. It was from tasting ice cream to cleaning grills to uh, running maintenance programs and, you know, being on the, a roof in Rockhampton in the middle of summer where it's 38 degrees and 100% humidity and you just sweat pouring off you while you're trying to sit under the swelter box mm -hmm. of a tin shack on the roof. Um, to then the you know, next day being in a cold room all day or a freezer that's broken down. Um, I have one recollection, um, it might not be for all viewers either, um, of fixing a cold room at a crocodile farm. Um, you can imagine that there's a lot of crocodiles to feed, so there's a lot of stock in this cold room that needs to be kept. Mm -hmm. um, and I had to walk over the top of this produce um to be able to get to the unit i was repairing was it so, at least in plastic or nope, anything? Okay. nope it was just all thrown into the cold That's room fair. and we need to get Cro this fixed crocs, fussy. crocs are not fussy. oh no but i know humans <laughs> are so yeah <laughs> so there was no room for a ladder so it had to be climbing the um carcasses that were in there but um you know that was just the joys and every day it was something different um, so I really enjoyed it. I did that for five years, completed my apprenticeship. I want to know, you obviously ended up proposing to I your did. girlfriend. I did, yes. How did you do it? It wasn't, oh, it wasn't in the cool room. At the it wasn't really in the cool not. room. It was actually, it was all over the place. I had planned everything. Okay. You know, we, I'm trying to think, I can't remember what year it was now. That's horrible. That's Six, okay. 2004 it was. So it was 12 months after we'd finished high school. Do you remember what date it was? 28th of October off the top of my head. I could be wrong. She would correct me most that likely. Would have to get um, but so I'd worked it. The 28th of October was a Thursday. Mm -hmm. So I had lined it up. We were going, you know, we'd had the conversations around marriage and, you know, we talked about a two year marriage, uh, sorry, two year proposal engagement. Mm. Um, and so I'd worked it. Well, if I propose on the 28th of October, that's a Thursday. So in two years' time, it's a Saturday. I'd even checked for the leap year. Oh, Make sure it wasn't out. And I worked out, brilliant, this will work. 
Um, she was supposed to be at work or uni. Um, she was training to be a school teacher, um, in particular primary school teacher. So that was her okay. passion in life. And um, so I'd gone into the house early to set a few things up and um, grabbed quite a few roses. Uh, rose was kind of the flower that we had, the, a nice deep red. Um, I'd started setting things up on a bed. I'd had four boxes um, and each one obviously had within it um, its own little box and I'd scattered roses all over a bed and then a path that sort of came out uh, into the lounge room. This is so romantic and we're going to go to a break and then you have to wait to find out what actually happens <laughs> next. This is Life First with Matt and Sarah we're chatting with Daniel. This is Life First with Matt and Sarah we're chatting with Daniel and I interrupted Daniel to hold everybody else in suspense mm. about what he was doing to propose to his girlfriend with roses everywhere and a path of roses leading yep. up to everything and roses and boxes inside of boxes <laughs> and this is just like it's an I, elaborate plan it, it is was. it is the romantic most romantic it's proposal most we've had on this show <laughs> that i can remember uh obviously it, yeah okay continue yeah. talking us through what happened no no worries um so she came home early um so i wasn't actually 100 percent finished um, oh no but that wasn't the worst thing to be honest <laughs> so she came home early and that just sort of threw me out but i'm a bit of a um let it fly type person so oh okay you changes. didn't tell her to like wait outside nah, or anything no nah, <laughs> nah, i let it go so yeah she came in we proposed so the boxes obviously as you took each lid off it said will you marry me and then the last box had the ring in it um well actually it didn't have the ring in it because i had the ring and i had remembered to get it out beforehand and um so yeah so i'm Proposed to her. Got and down on one knee. Yeah, did the whole did one the whole knee. Thing? And yes, Aww. I did that. But <laughs> this is where the story gets <laughs> funny. <laughs> her parents were home. So, you know, dad was home for either morning tea or lunch and her mum um, was home. So we went out and we said to them, you know, oh, we just got engaged. And they went, oh, good. The dad looks at me and he goes, what? <laughs> we just got engaged. She's like, I don't know anything about this. And she looks at me and Andrew goes, you didn't ask my dad. <laughs> The background story there is Andrea's dad is never serious. So I could have asked him and he would have point blank just gone, no. Nah. Even if he agreed, he would have said, no. Nah. <laughs> so that's kind of how that happened. And I've probably never been able to live that one down. Yeah. But I didn't ask him first. But yeah, so two years, well, actually it ended up being about two years and three weeks because her cousin decided to get married on the weekend that we wanted oh, to. You so well. didn't like yeah. communicate this? Well, we did maybe put in a bit of a complaint to the family, <laughs> um, but it, did, it just fell on deaf ears. Again, we were a bit more flexible and we were happy just to go, you know what, our wedding day is our wedding day and we're happy to move it. Um, so yeah, so that was two years down the track. So November 2006, we got married. I think we were about 20 at the time. Um, actually, we were both 20 at the time. Yeah, so that was just a a glorious day and we had really good weather for it which was even better and um so yeah been happily married since mm. so you're a very romantic guy then don't oh, that sounds a bit... yeah look that was probably my most romantic <laughs> i've been ever in that proposal um and i'm sure my wife would probably say that was the last time i lived totally <laughs> romantic but uh, yeah so um life i'm just trying to think where we sort of went from there we we're married for about three years. We in Rockhampton um, still. We're still in Rockhampton. Okay. Yeah, married for about three years. Andrew had been a teacher for three years mm -hmm. um, in that space, so it actually worked out well for her as well because she didn't want to do the whole name change as a teacher. Um, so getting married in November, she then started work as a teacher in January the following year. So she was always able to be Mrs. Wayman. Um, so she was pretty happy with that one, but. Um, so she, she did primary school teaching for three years in that space. I continued as an apprentice slash employee for her father mm -hmm. um, in that. And it was brilliant, really enjoying life. Um, mid to early 2009, we found out that we were expecting our first child. Um, so again, that was another change in life. And what does that look like? We bought a block of land with Andrew's parents, um, so a property just outside of Rockhampton. Mm -hmm. um, so we were kind of in that planning stage of building our own place. So there was one house on the block of land, and that was about it. And we kind of went, okay, we'll put a shed. So it was 24 acres 
we'll take four acres in the bottom corner and we'll put a you know a little shed down there as a house um, for our family to start with while we work out the transition. Mm-hmm. Well, um, things changed again throughout that year. Um, I felt a real calling to youth and kids ministry, um, you know, from a refrigeration and air conditioning mechanic to children's and youth ministry. That was a bit of a weird one at the time. That is weird. What happened in your head to make that happen? I think it's something I've always just been passionate about, but never saw a field in. Um, In particular, I think that's where I pushed the sporting side, I think, to be a coach or a mentor sort of in that space and to be able to help train and teach. And again, I think that was a part of my light bulb moments throughout my life that, Mm -hmm. you know, I'd really pushed more of that leadership and wanting just to help other people out and um, really be a part of how can I contribute back to them in that space. So um, I'd been to a a church camp um, when I was about 15, 16 in Mackay, which is about three and a half hours north of Rockhampton. Mm -hmm. And um, and something in that camp just spoke to me and said, you know, youth and kids work will be something that you invest in. Up until probably this point in 2009, which was, you know, five odd years later, um, well, probably more than that was eight years later, um, I probably never really thought where that was and probably really felt it was in some sort of sporting field. So being a coach in a sporting club or mentoring in that space. But um, a position became available in Gladstone as a youth and kids worker. So that Gladstone's about an hour and a half out of Rockhampton. We kind of went, yeah, it's close enough to family, but far enough away. You know, what does that look like? We've got a newborn on the way. Mm. Do we want to do this whole family thing without support of other family around us? How do we, you know, so we had the conversations between Andrew and I, and we'd applied to get the shed built on this four acres, and it got declined. Nobody could understand why. Um, The finance place went, we don't understand, you've got enough equity in the property. Uh, We'd had all the groundwork done, council approval, everything was sorted, ready to go. But for some reason, we just got declined and we never knew at that point why. Looking back now, we know that, you know, there was a a bigger hand in play in in that space that Mm. we would have moved to Gladstone. So um, Ezekiel, our firstborn, um, it was about four months after, so he was about four months old. We moved to Gladstone, had no house down there um, where we stayed with um, just a, a friend in a one bedroom apartment sort of granny flat thing there for about four months till we moved into a house, took on youth and kids ministry and I loved it. Um, Andrew was in one of 12 months off uh, as a stay at home mum. So she wasn't doing that, but obviously her expertise in the kids area was very uh, helpful for me in that space. So um, just worked on that and after 12 months, we sort of felt that it was time for a bit of a change again. Um, there was a big flood in 20, I think early 2011 in Rockhampton. And it's one of the downsides to Rocky. When we get a heap of rain, the river swells and it floods and actually mm. cuts off the highway completely. Mm. Um, so we had traveled back to see some family and um, Andrea's grandmother was quite unwell. So we wanted to hang around a bit longer. And um, my employers at the time said, you've got to come back to Gladstone. I said, no, nah, we need to be here. I'll take extra holidays. And they said, no, you either come back or you know, you're know, you out of work at this point in time. I'm, okay, what does this mean? Andrew's still not working. I wasn't, you know, I essentially didn't have a job. And the, um, the local ministers um, at Rockhampton actually said, oh, we're looking for someone at the moment. Uh, so we want to employ you straight away. So I transitioned straight back into Rockhampton and, it was a funny spot going back to your home church um, to take on a job of any description, I think. But I think our 12 months away sort of proved to them that we were serious in the role. And I don't know, I feel like I came back a more mature person, you know, with that experience of our 12 months in Gladstone as a young family. We did things probably differently to what our families would have wanted us to. We learned how to do things on our own. But Andrew and I have always just fallen on each other for support and you know, it's that age old thing where best friends. And I think, you know, we've always been best friends first um, in that space. So there's that openness in the mm-hmm. relationship. So we, we sort of push each other um, where we can in that space. So we came back, I think, better in that, in that field and uh, continued on for about another three or four years in that youth and kids work there. Andrea went back um, on and off um, for as a teacher at one of the local schools. And then um, Alora in late 2011 was born, our daughter. We kind of went, we got the pigeon pair. This is good, we're happy. 
Um, we sort of didn't feel happy in the line of work we were in though. Um, Andrew was a teacher, a lot of paperwork involved at the time, and I kind of lost my job as through funding um, falling through for the youth and kids work. So I was doing it as a volunteer um, and just still really enjoying the space and felt there was more. Um, the end of 2014. Well, that would be a good spot to pause, <laughs> I think. So, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of journey so far and still more to come. So yeah. another transition. We'll, we'll pause there. This is Life Burst with Sarah and Matt. We are chatting to Daniel and we'll be back in just a moment. Thank you for joining us on Life Burst with Sarah and Matt. Daniel is in the hot seat at the moment and is sharing us his story uh, living in Rockhampton. And you found yourselves in, in children and youth work in, mm. in the church, in the Salvation Army in particular. Yes. But it came to a point where that had to change. <laughs> it did, but it was still within the Salvation Army. Right. Um, so I was out of, out of work. Um, Andrew was had made the decision that she didn't want to be a teacher anymore. Um, so, you know, as the male, it's my responsibility to find work and make sure that you care for your family. I know it can be shared, but I felt that that was my thing. And mm-hmm. we struggled with that for a little bit. Her last pay packet um, was going to be coming through like on the 16th of January. And so we're in late December and we're just going, what are, what are we doing? What are, you know, What's actually happening here? What line of work am I going to step into? Um, who's going to do it? What, what, are we, what have we done? Um, yeah, like exactly. two days later, I get an email um, from what we call our divisional um, commander. So he was based in Rockhampton and he oversaw all of central North Queensland um, within mm. the Salvation Army. And he said, I think I've got, uh, I actually just said, I want to meet with you. And I thought, oh, great, I'm in trouble. I've probably said something wrong, done something wrong. That's my order make reaction. Your past coming back to It's you. back to my past. <laughs> I'm going to the principal's office. Um, so we met with them and they said, uh, we've just had, um, so in the Salvation Army, kind of moved people around a little bit, um, but that we had a couple doing what we call youth and children's work um, throughout the whole division. So they covered Bundaberg up to Cairns, out to Mount Isa and all of the places in between. And he said, um, they've moved up from Sydney, but they want to head back um, home and be a bit closer to family. We want to know if you guys are interested in taking on this role. And look, we pretty much got floored in that space, thinking we didn't know where we were going to go, what was going to happen. But um, so well, what's this work entail? So there was a lot of travel involved. Um, it was about resourcing leaders. It was about equipping them. You know, it was just helping them out in that space to actually facilitate where they could go mm-hmm. um, in that. So we said yes um, after maybe 24 hours of prayerful consideration. Um, and we started on the 15th of January. Mm. Um, so we just sort of sat back and went, wow, somebody's got all of this mm-hmm. under control to know that one pay packet finished in the end of the day that another one started. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, took on the role and um, we just really enjoyed it. Five years of traveling around Queensland for your job. Um, in that time, we had a, another little boy. We decided that pigeon pair weren't enough, so we had Nathaniel. Um, he was what we call our Jack Jack in the family. So if you've watched Incredibles, um, mm-hmm. he is that child that could go from giving you a hug to punching you to <laughs> screaming at you to laughing at you to everything within about a 30 second time mm-hmm. frame. And we love him for every little bit of it. Um, just brings his own personality in that space. So, um, you know, traveling with a baby got a little bit difficult at times, but we ran camps, events um, in that space. Uh, we had a program a bit like Scouts called Sagala. Um, so the kids loved attending all of these different things with us. Uh, but as a family, it was you know, we solved all the world's problems on the road and mm-hmm. we'd leave cans at um 10 30 11 o'clock in the morning and we get home by midnight to make sure that the kids are back at school for the older ones and um so we did many kilometers on the road throughout that couple of years but just being able to invest in people was really rewarding mm-hmm. um andrew's experience um through the schooling system was amazing to equip you know long, young leaders coming up we could sit with them and teach them how to you know how do you sit with that problem child essentially in that space where you know that kid they just couldn't get to settle down and was distracting everyone else we were able to give them hints and tips um as well as resourcing and exploring different options so Mm. um that was a good we started um a little bit of training and a bit of university which i never said i'd go back to but um, we took on some degrees just to help empower us in the role we were in um that kind of led to us putting our hands up to be 
not just youth and kids workers within the Salvation Army, but to actually take on a bit more responsibility or a different responsibility as what we call core officers, um, which is to run a church um, and be a bit more planted. The kids were, we'd um, had Jediah, I think at this stage, we moved to Bundaberg. So that's about three and a half hours south. You've probably heard of Bundaberg Rum or Bundaberg mm-hmm. Cola or Bundaberg Sarsa Perilla. Um, that is probably the best sauce yeah. you'll ever have. <laughs> so my wife would say, but I'm more of the lemon, lime and bitters. But uh, mm-hmm. we lived in Bundaberg for a couple of years and had our fourth child, Jediah, or Jedi for short. Um, so um, that was, again, another change in our lives. But our kids were you know, missing birthdays. We were away 35 weekends of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, they were missing birthdays all the time. Couldn't join sports clubs because everything's on the weekend. So... Mm-hmm. We made the decision that we needed a bit more stability, mm-hmm. put our hands up to the Salvation Army and said we want to you know, become core officers um, and change that sort of line of ministry that we were doing. Um, so we get a phone call saying, you know, you've nearly finished all your, your work that you need to to be a Salvation Army officer because of the study we'd done. Can we move you to Ballarat? So we're talking Bundaberg, again, hot, humid most of the year round. Apparently, Ballarat is cold all year round, which we didn't know until we moved there. Yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> but we did a bit of research, and it says it's cold for the majority of the year. Well, we didn't understand the difference in cold. So we moved down there, um, 2019, I think that was, that we moved to Ballarat. We did six months as core officers in a team at the, the church in Ballarat. Um, and the college that we were going through based out of Melbourne contacted us and went, you've done everything you need to bar two or three subjects. We want to fast um, pace you through to be finished. Um, so we then stepped out of the core, just did six months of study um, and placement sort of in that space. And then again, got a phone call to say, we want to move you to South Australia. Mm. So within this time, we'd been three states in three years. Mm. Um, the kids, our eldest, uh, he'd been, I think, in his fifth school. Uh, grade six so six years of schooling and five different schools Mm. so we moved to mount barker um 20 start of 2020 um and look it was an amazing place for three months (laughs) (laughs) covid hit and we were stranded in a town where we knew nobody literally nobody you know the closest family were thousands of kilometers three states away Mm. that you know you couldn't just jump on a plane and visit anymore because of covid um, and all the restrictions and everything there. So we kind of had to really just find our way again as a family, but we really could look back and go, all of this had been put in place beforehand in our time in Gladstone and, you know, uh, in just the different opportunities that we'd had as a family, even the, the travel time in that car, we'd seen that, you know, really just brought us together as a family in a mm. different way. Um, so our first 12 months were a little bit of a struggle in that space, but, you know, we just found that the community support came um, we're very fortunate to have a really good ministers um, group within Mount Barker. And so we just found a really good connection there in that space. And, and the people there were just really welcoming. And, you know, a congregation um, also just opened their arms, you know, to be able to welcome us. And look, it probably, most instances might take three to six months to get to know people. It probably took us a good 12 to 18 months mm. um, to really get to know them in a better space. But yeah, mm. we've really enjoyed our time at Mount Barker. And, the kids are flourishing. They've all joined sporting clubs or in different commitments. We found out our daughter is a brilliant runner um, and made states last year for running. So that was something we probably hadn't been able to connect the dots because she'd never really been able to um, get in those spaces. Mm-hmm. And all the kids have just found a nice space for them that they, you know, got good friendship groups. They're part of sporting clubs um, and enjoying that. And even for us now, we're slowly, you know, reaching out to different spaces and feeling settled as a family probably for the first time in a long time. Mm-hmm. But it's just that opportunity that, you know, for so long we were probably giving out um, of who we were and not yeah. that we're not still doing that, but we now actually realise it's not just about, you know, giving a hand to people, but how do we continue to support them in, in building up who they are? And it's been maybe a little bit of a motto um, that we've probably used in the last 12 months um, just in everything that we do. It's not just about a handout, but it's a hand up as well. Um, and it's it's journeying along and realising that there's so much more opportunity um, if we just invest mm. sort of in different spaces. And for us, that has been our kids, mm. you know, until we stopped just handing out and going, let's just go here all the time, but actually giving them that help up to recognise who they are, mm. how they can continue to improve who they are. 
um, which we've then been able to really relay into, you know, our different forms um, in our lives as well in the different environments that we're in. So oh, it's, good. it's a good learning. Yeah, yeah, it was an amazing yeah. learning opportunity. Yeah. And a great, op- yeah. Well, we'll uh, come back and hear more of Daniel's story. This is Life Burst with Sarah and Matt. This is Life Burst with Sarah and Matt. Uh, and Daniel, as you've come to this place, uh, you're in the Adelaide Hills, you're serving as an officer in the Salvation Army. Over the last couple of years, particularly since COVID, um, you're personally exposed to a lot of the, the needs of a community. Um, what's personally impacted you over um, yeah, over that time, uh, apart from the family isolation <laughs> and all that settling in? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, what's the things that have struck you? Um think just the sense of community um and again it's not something we'd had a lot of so just being able to reach out and really for me to gain that understanding of what is a community's needs and um you know just to hear the hearts of people so you you have conversations with somebody and it's like you know this is something i'm just really in need of at the moment so to sort of then i'm i like to not take a no for a no um, but a no just means that nobody's found the solution yet. So I push the envelope. And again, I think that's my rebellious side that comes mm-hmm. out from those primary and high school days. But um, but also, how do I do that in the right way? So I've really pushed myself to go, okay, you know, somebody needs meals. How can we provide meals in that space? And what does that look like? Who can I network with or who's already providing it? Um, so I've been able to just throw myself out there a little bit. And I am an extrovert, so that's easier for me to do. Um, then I know it might be for some other people, but yeah, just, I think that exploration for me to trying to discover who I am now in this different space and bringing a different hat even into it. So, you know, from the person who walks in off the street that just has nothing and how can I help them and support them in that to, um, you know, our, our, our church member that just says actually times are just tough at the moment. And so, well, what are you now? I just need someone to sit and have a coffee with or something. So that's great. They just want a coffee. This person, you know, needs so much more support. But the realities are on very similar paths and very similar. Um, Does it ever get overwhelming? Oh, often, mm. very often. And like any industry, um, you know, there is still paperwork involved. So the pressures are coming from four or five different directions. Um, you know, we've got teams over us that are saying, you know, we need to keep the finances in track. You need to make sure that, you know, all your paperwork's up to date. Volunteers need 17 different checks and training and everything there. How do you provide that space to mm-hmm. being available for, you know, that phone call or that person that might come through the door and is just looking for someone to chat to, mm. um, you know, to even taking on chaplaincy roles within the community and um, little things like that that you kind of went three, four years ago, I probably wouldn't have even imagined how to go about it. And, you know, now just having to do it. And, and for me, it is, it's, you've just got to get in and do it. And I've learned a big lesson along the way that, you know, sometimes it's okay to say no, um, which I struggled with and my personality and my background has just always been, all right, you need something, let's do it. You need something, let's do it. Um, for me to realize actually sometimes that's detrimental to me personally, but even to my family and to my line of work. And, you know, that, it isn't, if I'm burnt out, if I'm no use to anybody, then that's actually a bigger hole than for me to say no to one thing and find that transition. But I think I've just really enjoyed the community space and, you know, the way that the community rallied during COVID that we were able to just support each other through different agencies, whether they were Christian, non-Christian, um, church, non-church, whatever you wanted to call it at the time, it was just, there's a need for the town. What can each person supply? Mm and provide in that space and that enjoyment that came from that um you know that engagement came in connecting with people that are hearing a different story i think at the same time in 2020 it was coming out of the bushfires um so there was quite a lot of people you know still searching for what that you know looked like for them personally and hearing some of those stories was you know just uh it was a difficult space at the time but um, again, my experience back in Rockhampton where it can get hot and dry and we'd been through a few bushfires up there as well as floods that um, high emergency sort of stakes situations. And so, you know, we, we wear so many different hats at different times from an emergency service person who's there feeding the fireys or feeding the support workers to the next day needing to be, you know, having a, a lengthy conversation with somebody who's just lost their house and 
you know, how do I go about getting toys? How can I go about new furniture? You know, and working alongside salvo stores to provide what they need to, um, you know, sitting at my desk for two hours, even though I'd prefer to be out doing something else, knowing that there's paperwork required. Mm. You know, we've got to continue with that side of things and make sure that it's right and it's above board so that we can continue through the support of it to, you know, we lost pretty much all of our volunteers through COVID um, due to their age and, and, you know, many other places will say the same thing. But, you know, I, we lost our finance guy um, probably about two months before end of financial year, first year in a core appointment or a church appointment. And we just went, what does this mean? Um, so to be able to jump on the phone and talk to a support network that just helped talk me through what all that meant. And so my journey has just been a continual development of learning. Um, again, I'm not the biggest to sit in a classroom and learn, but I do love the idea of continually upskilling myself and, you know, understanding something different or if I don't understand it is asking the extra questions. How else can I improve this? How else can I make that better? Or how can I streamline it to make it mm. um, easier for someone else? So I've always had that strive um, and whether that was, you know, for me on the sports field as a family um, or within, you know, my, my field of work that I'm in at that time, you know, how can I improve things and, and make it better has just been something I've continued to push for and um, continuing to develop in that as well. So, yeah, I've just, each week, each day is always something different and sometimes it's harder, sometimes it's easier. And some weeks I'll feel like I'm twiddling my thumbs in the office and I don't feel right for it personally, but I also know that that's a week I just need to have a rest because the next week 18 things will happen in the first three days and you go okay so this is why i had a quiet week last week and yeah. this is why you know i needed that that break in that space because everything's just sort of escalated at once in that so yeah so I've, I, I love what i do uh, i all the good days the bad days you know i'm probably one of the first up in the house most mornings in that keenness and eagerness to um, continue just exploring and again, that correlation, I suppose, even from my days as a refrigeration mechanic, every day was different. You didn't know what the phone call was going to be for what job you were going to go to. And I still feel it's the same today that, you know, I wake up with a smile on my face going, I wonder what today's going to bring or what's that exciting story or who's that person I'm going to sit with today just to be able to be with them and be able to support them through whatever situation that looks like. Yep. <laughs> yep. So much that you've just packed into the past 50 minutes. Mm, <laughs> so yeah. thank you. In the final like one minute of the show that we have left, Daniel, if you had one piece of advice to share with everyone today, what would that be? Um, you've only got a minute. A minute. Uh, <laughs> one piece of advice would probably be um, don't be okay with where you're at right now. No matter what that looks like, I think you can always change. You can always improve. You can always develop. Um so I think if there's one thing you can continue is continue to learn, continue to to strive for something. Excellent. You do that in less than a minute. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> Good. Yeah, great thank advice you. too. So thank you, Daniel, so much thank for sharing you. your journey and uh, an overview of, of many years, many challenges, and mm -hmm. uh, and great to hear your heart and your love for what you do now. Mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. It's been a real pleasure to have you in on the show today. Thank you. Uh, thank you to you as well if you're listening or watching to Life Burst. You can catch up with us wherever you get your podcasts from, from YouTube, Facebook, and on community television and radio. I'm Sarah. And I'm Matt. Join us again next time on Life Bursts. Life Bursts is hosted by Matthew Karat and Sarah Freeman with production by Reese Jarrett and Kay Hoshra Ozadigan. For more episodes of Life Bursts, go to rawcut.com.au. This is a raw cut production.